dung beetles want are actually the folds in the pack. That's where they're more likely to go for access. And the bigger the pack, the happier the dung beetles. That's what they like. They don't like splats. So dung beetles fly because their habitat is forever changing. It's forever breaking down and going away. So they have to fly. So this is another beetle that lives in dung. Um, this is a clown beetle, a hysterid. But basically think of a tank with jaws on the front and that's what that thing is. That'll eat anything else in the dung pack. Beetle, this thing will whiz all over my hand when it gets itself the right way up. There you go. Dung beetles don't whiz like that. They're not in the, in the process. They will move around, but they won't whiz. Sitting comfortably, seatbelts on, we're off on another adventure in Utopia with me, David Brown. Mm. Okay. Hands up for a butterscotch. Much of this episode, including Sally Ann Spence's Dung Beetle Safari that you just heard, was recorded live at Groundswell in Hertfordshire, an annual festival dedicated to exploring more ecological and sustainable approaches to farming. Groundswell was set up by brothers John and Paul Cherry, who in 2010 converted to a type of farming known as regen regenerative. I can't say that word. There are some pretty sobering facts out there about the impact of global agriculture's propensity towards mega-industrial farming, monoculture, intensive animal farming, and a heavy reliance on pesticides, fertilizers, and irrigation. The problems are many and complex. Ploughing seriously disrupts the complex ecosystems of our soils and depletes soil health. Farm waste in countries like the UK has become the biggest form of water pollution. Monoculture causes serious biodiversity loss and also depletes the quality of soil. Pesticides decimate insect and bird life and pollute our waterways. Intensively farmed animals are often kept in appalling conditions. We overuse antibiotics and an ever-growing global demand for meat continues to see widespread destruction of rainforests, wetlands and other fertile land to grow crops not to feed us directly, but to feed the cattle that feed our addiction to burgers. As farmland accounts for 40% of global land use, some are calling it an agricultural Armageddon, or Farmageddon. Whoever thought of that must have been quietly pleased with themselves. But we're not here just to dwell on what's wrong with farming, but to explore new ecologically minded systems that might show us the way forward. We're going to learn about the wonders of soil, the no-till movement, mob grazing, and the magic of hemp. We'll hear George Monbiot on how to minimize the impact of global farming through precision fermentation. But we'll begin by meeting septuagenarian farmer Daphne Astor and Abby Rose, co-creator of Farmerama, a brilliant podcast that shares innovative and ecological farming stories. And we'll find out exactly what is regener regenerative farming. Ugh. But I've also seen this word regenerative, regenerative See, it's not just me. Um, yeah, so I think regenerative farming, certainly that word, regenerative, um, is relatively new. Um, but certainly many of the practices that it's advocating are not, partic are not new. So what it's replacing, essentially, is this chemical paradigm that we've been living through for the last, well, at least 80 years. Well, monoculture really is at the core of it. I think the more people can understand what monoculture is, um, and how vulnerable it is, um, the more you can realize how nonsensical that whole system and narrative is about the uh, chemical food system. Monocultures are at the core of it. You know, you need to have these massive fields that have everything the same so you can bring in a machine, go through the crop, and it's all exactly the same height. Uh, it, you know, you douse it in the same chemicals and it just, it reacts exactly the same everywhere. And that's vital for like the machinery and the, the infrastructure we've built in order to have the food system we've built work. So when you sell wheat as a farmer, there's certain scientific um, requirements that you have. And one of them is like that your protein level is above a certain percentage if you want it to go for milling wheat. Otherwise it goes to feed animals. But the reason that that protein percentage is that is because the machinery required to create bread um, in the, um, the systems, the very quick methods that we're trying to do today requires the protein level to be that high. So it's nothing to do with actual needs of human beings or when you're baking and dough, none of that. It's all about the machinery 
and the technologies. And that's why we end up in a system today, like where we are producing flour that has zero nutritional value. And that's what we get on our supermarket shelves. Um, that's because that was a requirement in order for like the machinery along the way to work, which would allow us to quickly produce a lot of flour, which then allows us to quickly produce bread. It ends up, you know, the government then has to legislate that we need to put nutrition back into the flour. I mean, that is mental. You know, that is the old system. That's the old paradigm is like, it made sense in the forward direction. I don't think anyone made stupid decisions along the way, basically. And so I think right now, everyone's sort of taking a step back. Um, and so it's a moment where a lot of people are asking some really big questions about maybe we've gone too far in this system and actually we need a new system. And that's where regenerative agriculture um, is sort of, it's telling a story that fills that void. Um, it's a story based on complexity, diversity, um, the health of soils and the health of communities. Okay, I'm Daphne Astor. I'm a regenerative farmer. Been farming for 45 years here in the UK and before that in America. I'm a rural woman. Yeah, I was born in Manhattan. It was never silent. It was never empty. You were never alone. There were no animals. It was not the right spot <laughs> for me. And so I used to pretend that, you know, the hook and ladder truck was like a giraffe and that the, the big buses were like elephants. And I used to, you know, in the museums, I would think that the people were like flamingos. But my husband's uh, grandmother was the first woman in parliament here. And my own grandmother was a cowgirl in New Mexico. So I've, I'm, um, I'm from a long line of awkward women. <laughs> I would say. For me personally, it's been a hugely uh, optimistic transition in our farm because I married into a traditional farm and I've been pestering for change for years and years and years. So uh, at this point in our lives, we are, we've changed everything in terms of the way we farm. We've got rid of all the equipment, so we now have new people working with us who have an interest in regenerative farming. Now, regenerative farming does not have a single definition, but for us, it's um, pursuing the most, uh, the most positive path of nature for nature, as opposed to looking at yields. We're looking at how we can keep the place that we love, the trees that we love, the pastures that we love, the arable areas that we love, as healthy as possible for now and for the future and also that we can involve other people with it and we are still learning and trying to make as to, to provide food that is affordable for many many people in this country because one of the issues about the food deal in this country at the moment is that privileged people can buy healthy food and other people have difficulty so I, I'm very interested in growing food that is healthy food but that is affordable and regenerative, I think, I hope, is the way to go. But animals are absolutely essential to our land. They, first of all, their hooves aerate the land. They poop and they pee, which is fertilizer on the hoof. And also, um, each animal eats the grass in a different way. Some of them tear it, some of them chomp it. And all of that is terribly important for the regenerative power of the plants. And I think one of the things about this kind of farming and this kind of relationship with the soil and with nature is that um, it makes you quite humble. And you turn your hand to what's needed to be done, not what you think you would like to do for yourself. So I've learned really, farming has been, it's such a magic way of life. I mean, it's, it's you know, you, you don't forget about the stars at night. You, you notice when the moon is full. You pay attention to the rain. The scent of the spring flowers, you know, refreshes you again. Time to introduce the key principles of regenerative farming. Number one, don't disturb the soil, which means no ploughing at all. Number two, always keep the soil surface covered and keep living roots in the soil. Three, grow a diverse array of crops. Four, minimize the use of pesticides and fertilizers. And five, bring grazing animals back to the land. We'll explore these in more details as we go along. For now, back to Abby Rose. You know, why is this important for the soil? Why do we have those principles? And I think, for me, it's best kind of understood 
just by doing a little kind of dramatization almost of the path. You have your plant. It's green and it's photosynthesizing um, and it's drawing carbon down out of the atmosphere, creating carbohydrates inside of it. Um, and it will put about 10 to sometimes 60% of it down into its roots. And the reason it puts it into the roots is because it's part of this like world below our feet. So the soil is this living web, an organism. Um, it's almost unimaginable. Like in one handful of soil, there are more organisms, uh, more living things than there are people on the planet. So one, in one handful? One handful, just one handful. So it's unbelievably alive below our feet. And when you start to realize that, then you start to think like, wow, the roots are the way that the plant interacts with this living world. Um, and actually that living world is there to support the plant because it's, it, there's a symbiosis there. It, it survives off of the plant, so it wants to bring the things the plant wants. And so like, for example, the plant might need some phosphate, um, which you know plants need to be able to be healthy and grow. Um, and so it will put a little message out through its roots saying, I need some phosphate. Um, and then the bacterial and fungal world will receive that message, chemical signaling. It will go away. It's able to kind of dissolve phosphate within the soil. It brings it back through the fungal pathways up back to the bacteria. The bacteria will give it to the root. And in exchange, it will give the bacteria some sugar. And that exchange there is like, um, that's carbon sequestration in action, you could say, because that's when the carbon then moves into the soil living world. Um, and also at the same time, that's where healthy soil is built because those bacteria then secrete slimes, um, which will create healthy soil structure. So it brings together like clay, sand and silt molecules um, and it sticks them together in a way that they have, they're amazing at retaining water. So suddenly your soil is very resilient in drought or in heavy downpours. It can hold water for a long period of time. Um, it's also got uh, oxygen through the profile so there's way more life able to live um, and it also then allows for healthy plants to grow um, you know where before you were having to like manage the plant getting lots of pest and disease problems suddenly the plants are actually managing themselves so it's this amazing symbiosis or like multi symbiosis that happens when you start to get the biological system in action and working with the plants and again in the same way that we're looking for diversity above ground we also need to see diversity below ground. Um, and I think for most people, probably the easiest way to understand it is to parallel it with the gut microbiome, right? Because we call it the soil microbiome. It's exactly the same as the gut microbiome in that, you know, we want to have a very complex, diverse gut microbiome so that we can, well, that's what good gut health is and yeah. that's what a healthy human is. And that's exactly what you need in the soil to have a, a healthy functioning soil system. We'll hear more from Abby later on, but for now let's explore the first principle of regenerative farming. Don't disturb the soil. Now how does a farmer not disturb the soil? Blake may have written The Cut Worm Forgives the Plough, but should worms have had their own form of cancel culture back in the late 1700s, the poet might have been top of their hit list. We might have been ploughing or tilling, as the Americans say, for centuries, but in light of Abby's comment about the complex, interdependent living world beneath our feet, you can imagine what the act of repeatedly churning the soil up does to this ecosystem. The no-till movement sprang out of the US in the 1990s. One of its key exponents is Duane Beck. Duane has been running the Dakota Lakes Research Farm since 1990. He hails from South Dakota, and his baseball cap, a permanent fixture on his head, sports the words... South Dakota. This is a man who tells it like it is. Uh, Mother Nature does not do tillage other than uh, it's a catastrophic event like a landslide or a earthquake or something like that. <clears throat> One of my favorite statements is that tillage is to agriculture what fracking is to petroleum. Increases the uh, speed of which you can extract nutrients but it leaves uh, the substrate degraded. When you do tillage you just destroy it all. It's just it's just the biggest catastrophe that could ever happen in the soil. Tillage started initially man started to farm because it was a way to to speed the 
extraction of nutrients from the soil. And to a certain extent, they got by with that because they would stay someplace and degrade it for a while and move on, and then the Mother Nature would come back in and kind of restore it. Uh, No-till is just the first step. You know, that stops part of the bleeding. And then you start trying to do, we try to use a diversity in cropping systems and we use animals in, this, in the processes and whatever, and that works better. The philosophy right now for most agriculture is I got a bug, let, what can I kill it with? And that's not the right approach. Um, I got a bug there that's a problem, how do I take away the opportunity or take away the conditions that I created that allowed him to, to do that? One of the things that happens with insects, if you have something flowering at the wrong time and the mother moth is flying along and she sees that, she'll lay her eggs there because she's interested in her babies. And I don't really like her babies. So I, if I don't have that thing flowering right at that period of time, I don't have the babies. More of a prevention management type thing than a, than a war. It's not, we're not, we're not fighting mother nature we're working with. Farming accounts for an incredible 70% of land use in the UK. In other countries, this number is even higher. And the conservation charity RSPB have long observed the direct and dire effects of monoculture on our bird and insect numbers. So they decided to try an experiment by buying an arable farm in Cambridgeshire. At Groundswell Festival, I spoke to their head of land, season and climate policy team, Jenna Hegarty, which takes us into regenerative to our regenerative principle number two, diversity. It was an experiment, um, but by you know using kind of very relatively simple um, changes to farming practices, you know, uh, growing different crops, you know, ex- kind of expanding the, the crop rotation um, by having more landscape features, letting the hedges actually do more hedgy stuff, like grow thicker and taller and, and, and have more um, berries to feed birds. We've seen um, farmland bird numbers, I mean, increase by, uh, breeding birds increased by nearly 200% in 20 years. Um, If that was done um, where it's it's needed, you know, we wouldn't have a farmland bird decline problem. So that the the problem there is absolutely fixable. And I think you can replicate that looking at all sorts of environmental issues, whether it's water quality, soil health. We know a lot of the solutions, but what we don't have at the moment is the political will to really drive those at scale. What does regenerative, and I struggle to say this word, what does regenerative farming mean to you? It's fine. We'll soon shorten it to just regen farming and it'll make life a lot easier for everyone. I think any anything that um, is degrading any aspect of our environment, whether it's soil, water, wildlife, it can never, can never tick the, the regen box. I mean, it's a big... Um, reason why we're in the mess that we're in is because we have whole scale essentially disconnected ourselves from nature. We see ourselves as, as people, as not part of nature, when we absolutely are. And, and we, we view ourselves as separate and different and better um, at our peril. We will not survive unless we inject ourselves very mindfully back into nature as a, as a, as a system. And, you know, this is not about turning the clock back, but it is, it is about actually applying the kind of that cultural knowledge from, from you know, centuries, millennia ago into how we do things now, but with, with a, modern, um, a modern hat. You sound like a pagan at heart. <laughs> Maybe I am. <laughs> One of the serious problems with monoculture are all the things that attack the crops. Pesticides and fertilisers are thrown at the problem. A good percentage of these leach into and pollute the environment and waterways. A lack of biodiversity tends to mean a lack of natural predators to whatever's eating the crops and these in turn become ever more resilient to pesticides. Soil quality diminishes over time so more and more fertilisers and pesticides are added and the problems spiral. In 2019, Abby was part of a Farmerama spin-off podcast series called Serial, all about diversity and crops. And one of her favourite stories involved Professor Martin Wolf. He was a uh, crop scientist, plant scientist at Cambridge University, you know, really working very much within the conventional paradigm. I, after years of 
trying to create a new fungicide each year in order to be able to kill the fungus problems they were having on the wheat crops, he realized like this is pointless. <laughs> I'm just having to create a new product every year. Then you know the natural world is evolving faster than I can create um, something to kill it essentially. And that's where he started to really rethink about you know what is it in like Darwin's theory of evolution that actually allows for uh, a flourishing plant world and, and flourishing life. And he really realized that it's, it was vital to have diversity and that actually diversity is the key to resilience over generations. Um, and that the more diversity you introduced into the wheat field, the less fungus problems you have because the fungus problem is, is a function of the lack of diversity, essentially. It's an overpopulation of one type of fungus that then causes this issue in a crop. He took a modern wheat variety. Uh, he took many modern wheat varieties, sorry. He, he crossed them and then he created this modern wheat population, it's called. It means that the genetic diversity in the seed is very, very high. So like, for example, within two acres of wheat, you wouldn't find one other wheat plant that had the same genetics as, as the one you were looking at. Whereas most of our fields today are monoculture, so every single plant has exactly the same genetics as the plant next to it, which is a recipe for disaster. As we, you know, obviously if a disease comes, it's going to hit the first one, then it's just going to say, wow, there's loads of these, great, I'm going to go for it. Um, whereas if you have diversity, it hits the first one and then it will only affect certain ones because actually there's a whole raft of different things going on there that it can't just populate, you know, uh, expand rapidly. Um, so, you know, Professor Martin, Martin Wolf, he sadly died a few years ago now, but he really has caused a, a seismic shift, I would say, in understanding what is at the basis of ecological farming and, and how we can build a food system going forward that really is resilient and supports us all and feeds us all. Biodiversity calls for a wider array of crops to be grown. Hemp, as we're about to find out, used to be grown globally. Its TCH levels, which determine its potency, are so low compared to cannabis that like top deck shandy lager for kids in the 70s that required 40 cans to get you slightly drunk, you'd have to smoke a whole field of low TCH hemp to get high. But such is the paranoia of many governments, however, that it remains a controlled substance. Here's Rebecca Shaman, MD of the Hemp Alliance, discussing hemp as a crop that can not only help with biodiversity, but as she says at the end, maybe one of our best friends in the plant world. Hemp, hemp really is uh, an amazing crop. It uh, is a soil remediator, so it, it brings soil back into balance. It, it, it helps soil um, come back to a healthy um, optimum, and uh, it breaks up compacted soils, and it has a fibrous uh, root ball, so the root ball spreads out and connects to other of the other hemp plants, and so it breaks up a lot of the um, soil compaction, um, bringing uh, soil health back in, worms and microbes back into the soil. Also, the plant itself doesn't need any herbicides or pesticides because it's essentially a weed. So it outgrows other weeds and kills them off naturally. So you don't need herbicides or pesticides, which then again reduces the uh, climate impact that it has. And it's also a fantastic uh, alternative to trees um, because it grows like a tree. I mean, the five metre uh, hemp varieties really are very, very woody. And uh, so as a deforestation for an alternative to deforestation, uh, we could be growing hemp and turning that into paper. In fact, an acre of hemp provides four times more paper than an acre of trees, since also it's not uh, needing to grow like 30 years like a tree does, and also it doesn't destroy the soil like uh, trees can do, so it, it, it can do everything in a very short amount of time. So I, I just want to make clear that um, hemp isn't illegal to grow. You can grow hemp here in the UK. You've been able to, we were one of the first countries in Europe to actually enable hemp growing in the UK, but you have to get a license and you need to get that license from the Drugs and Firearms Department of the Home Office. The rest of the world seems to be waking up a lot much quicker to hemp. Uh, well, North America in general actually have really embraced the cannabis um, plant in all its forms from medicinal uh, to industrial. We've had loads of farmers that really want to grow hemp, but while it's considered a controlled 
uh, crop, it is really difficult to find the right funding. Uh, there's a, um, a lot of stigma still attached to uh, hemp, and so it's very hard to get the links in the chains. And we are unable at the moment to harvest the leaf or the flower, which is um, the most uh, profitable part of the plant, but also the most important food of the plant. Uh, Canada um, got 14.1 billion uh, dollars last year, Canadian dollars, on their cannabis industry. That's medical, recreational and um, hemp. And on one quick side note, it was illegal not to grow hemp under Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. You had to grow uh, one rood, R-O-O-D, of your land, if you were a landowner, had to be hemp and you could pay your taxes with it because it was considered really, really valuable and it built the maritime industry, um, it built our navy. And here we are, where we're not able to see that same, the same benefits. So we know that hemp works. We know that it's been a, a very valuable crop in the past. Um, it's been used in the, in, throughout history. It's the oldest crop on the planet, 10,000 years. It's, the, it's our best friend in the plant world. Thank you. And it just remains for me to say that at a festival of farmers, you are the best dressed person. <laughs> Actually, this here. is hemp. <laughs> is it hemp? Yeah. <laughs> you look amazing. You've got a fantastic hat with a feather in it. You've got these beautiful beaded earrings. Um, this this white jacket with with patterns so, sort of crocheted into it. Um, glittery eye makeup. You are you just you stand out from the crowd here. She didn't comment on my latex yellow cat suit. Hmm. Being a farming festival, Groundswell has no need for big live bands, stand-up comedy or the kind of immersive theatre events that you might get at other festivals. Not when you've got things like dung beetle safari, fashion stalls selling both blue and check shirts, spangly new no-till farm machinery which spikes the ground for seed planting, or John Cherry, who set up Groundswell on his farm, doing a spot of mob grazing at the beginning and end of the day which always draws huge crowds. Mob grazing essentially means keeping the cows moving from one area to another and leads us into the final principle of regen farming that we're going to explore, bring grazing animals back to the land. We'll walk a while with John Cherry and American farmer Greg Judy and we'll hear again from Abbey Rose. And if, if left to their own devices, cows would, would naturally, yes. they'd be nomadic. It's only when white man arrived and we started putting up fences when we got in trouble. So the fence is the root of all evil? Yes. <laughs> they, actually, they actually look quite good. Um, I know the herd here is, um, it's just getting better and better and like, and since they started moving the animals every day um, and putting them on things like this herbal lay, they haven't, you know, they haven't had to give antibiotics in five years. They, it's like, a, it, the animals just look after themselves. But they have to move them every day because, you know, that's the point is like the animals need to have the new food and, and they're not kind of sitting in the areas where their poo was and that's where you get parasite problems. And that whole thing is based off of like how animals move across large areas of land when they're not being confined by walls or human technologies. And obviously they move as packs and they move on all the time, right? Because that's their survival at risk there um, and they need new food. So. If we mimic that, what you see is that actually the soil and the, the life responds much better if you start to do that. It's only when you kind of put in these like weird constructs of walls and just leaving animals within these four walls for long periods of time that you get all these other problems that come out of it. Just a bit, a bit like Martin Wolf's thing, you know, it's like if you try and grow a monoculture, you're inevitably going to have fungal problems every year and they're going to get worse every time and you apply a fungicide, it'll just get worse and you go down this path of like crisis again and again and again. So this is much more about diversity and, and working with the natural systems that are here.
One of the things I really like about these regen farmers is how their philosophy seems to seep into other areas of their lives. We met softly spoken farmer Daphna at the beginning. She's also a publisher now and applying some of the principles of regeneration to the publishing industry. So when I turned 70, I, decided, I reflected on my life and decided that I would start a publishing company and that it would be reflective of the things that I believe in and how I live. So I decided to commission new work to make each book very, very beautiful and to <coughs> make books that, was wor that were worth cutting down trees for. I then began to think about how are books produced? I, I knew nothing about it. And so I didn't even know the word imprint page, but the first page you look in that gives you all the information about what is this book and how is it made is the imprint page. And when you read it, you see that bottom sometimes it says FSC. What's FSC? Well, it's sustainable forests. The paper comes from sustainable forests. But actually, it means very little because it's just that the trees are grown sustainably. Once they're cut down in the process that they go through to become paper, they don't touch at all. So I spent a lot of time um, figuring out how I could find very good printers. Now, it's all a compromise at the moment because this is just at the beginning. But the laws are changing and printers are beginning to wake up to the fact that many other people want to print ethically. And uh, here's, I've, I'm doing a bit of bibliomancy. I've just opened at random. Okay, number 23. My seven-year-old granddaughter was staying with me and she had a dream that made her sob and shout and bang her fists against the wall. Let's go outside, I said. And she paused and grew quiet while I gathered her up in my arms. We stood in the dark garden and she leaned back to stare at the sky. Look, Nona, look, look at the beautiful stars. So these are sort of related to the land, but we've also, probably our most radical book is a book about female orgasm, which we, is an anthology where we asked, invited poets from all over the world. It's called O, oh, which is appropriate. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and we, we chose to do this book because it didn't exist. And it's been, my, I said to my husband, you know, I'm doing this, this book of very, very beautiful erotic poetry by straight women, gay women, trans women, women who are of all ages and from many, many different nationalities. And he was a little dubious, I think, but he read it and said, this is a book for men. There is a dissenting voice amongst all of this, not from a reactionary or traditionalist either. Journalist, ecologist, activist, and a man who also can't say regenerative, Jennifer. George Monbiot. His 2022 book, Regenesis, argues the case for minimizing all forms of animal farming, including organic, arguing that pasture-fed animals offer just too low a yield for too large a land use, and that they heavily compromise the local ecology. Instead, he proposes cultivating protein through a means called precision fermentation, utilizing a microbe found in soil and similar to the way products like corn are made from fungi. George was one of the guest speakers at Groundswell that year, but it was at his allotment in Oxford that I got to talk to him about his big vision for the future of food and farming. George, hello, it's David Brownwell. I'm just at the entrance. Uh, I am, yeah. Okay, all right, bye-bye. Nice to meet you, George. And you, David. Hi. <laughs> Food production is, by a very long way, the most destructive thing we do. It's the primary cause of land use, primary cause of habitat destruction, of wildlife loss, of extinction, of soil degradation, of freshwater use. It's one of the top causes of climate breakdown, water pollution, air pollution and yet we tend to neglect and sideline it. And the challenge is that we have to feed 8 billion, one day 10 billion people um, in a way that doesn't burst through planetary boundaries. And already 
farming is bursting through those boundaries. And, and somehow we now have to produce more food while doing less damage. The biggest challenge of all is how we produce protein-rich foods without massive environmental destruction. Um, while food and farming are by far and away the biggest cause of environmental destruction, animal farming is by far and away the biggest component of that. Um, it uses um, by far the majority of, of the land used, used for farming. Um, it causes a very high proportion of the pollution, the habitat loss, um, and, and many other massive issues, including the, the greenhouse gases that farming produces. How do we provide protein-rich foods for everyone, uh, cheaply and healthily? Well, um, we could grow lots of beans and pulses, and I happen to eat a lot of beans and pulses, and I would love it if other people ate those, but there's not a, a massive demand for that, and people are very reluctant to adopt that kind of diet. So we also, um, and perhaps primarily, have to find good, cheap, healthy substitutes for the animal products we eat, which bear as strong a similarity as possible to those products. And there's been a lot of innovation in this area using plant-based um, meat substitutes, milk substitutes and the rest of them. Some are pretty good, some are pretty awful, um, but we're on the threshold of a transformative change which will make all that much easier while massively lowering the environmental impact even of plant-based foods which is, is much lower already than animal-based foods and this is called precision fermentation which is basically a sophisticated form of brewing and instead of making protein-rich foods out of animal flesh and animal secretions it makes protein-rich foods from microbes instead which you brew in a vat very much like you brew beer or make yeast for bread making. Um, and what you get out the end of this is um, a protein rich flour, which can be much more easily turned into the, the products we might wish to make than a lot of plant products are. So it's got the potential not just to relieve this huge burden of animal farming, but also um, to substitute products like soy and palm oil and coconut which are extremely damaging and they're less damaging than animal products but they're still extremely damaging plant um, based products because precision fermentation is is modular it can be done in, in the factory it has cost curves probably quite similar to digital cost curves that you can't achieve in animal farming because you hit hard limits of what a multicellular organism can bear and uh, already you know, animals have been pushed so far that they suffer appalling welfare and health issues. Um, and they can't be pushed much further, however cruel and nasty it becomes, that, that there are hard limits. But um, producing microbes, you can increase the efficiency, bring down the cost quite a long way from, from where we are now. And so they're going to become very cheap. This is going to become a very cheap source. It um, seems to be a very healthy source. You can um, develop products from it where you screen out a lot of the bad stuff, which is, which is in animal products, which can make us unhealthy, um, and, and also engineer in a lot of better things, like you know, more B12, more omega-3s, whatever it might be. Um, and very quickly have got um, the basis for a whole new cuisine, which will, you know, I think, not only quickly substitute for animal products, but also we'll rapidly see the development of a whole load of foods we can't even envisage at the moment. Just as the first farmers in the Neolithic who captured a wild cow weren't thinking about camembert, we have no idea what dietary shift this, this will trigger, but I suspect it will be as profound as the dietary shift caused by the dawn of agriculture. I asked George about his experiences in a precision fermentation lab. The, the one I went to see was in Helsinki in Finland, where they uh, use um, a, a microbe found in the soil called um, Cupriovides necator, which is a hydrogen oxygenating bacterium. That means that its food is hydrogen and it uses hydrogen very much like plants use sunlight but actually in a far more efficient process than plants conversion of sunlight into usable energy and um, and and so that's their feedstock you don't need to give them any 
plant products or anything else produced by agriculture. And when this takes off, it'll be the um, first staple food we've ever had, which doesn't owe itself to photosynthesis at any part of the food chain. Right. Um, and so it's, it's a radically different way of producing food. Now, I'm, I'm proud enough and vain enough to say that I was the, the first person outside the lab to eat a pancake made from this flour, uh, a small flip for man. And um, <laughs> it, the amazing thing about it was it tasted just like a pancake. Now, obviously, they're not just in the business of making pancakes. I mean, this could be the basis for just about anything we eat, which is protein or fat rich. It's really lovely. Yeah, really nice to meet you, George. Okay. Um, good luck well, with the move. Thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Okay. All right, take care. Bye bye. In his book Regenesis, Monbiot envisions a future in which great fermentation factories exist in all of our cities across the globe, drastically reducing animal farming and allowing the land to rewild. Precision fermentation feels like a necessary story for our time, a new myth to live by, as does regenerative and getting there farming. These may be different narratives, but both ultimately are concerned with reducing our environmental impact and increasing biodiversity. Through Groundswell and Abby Rose's Farmerama podcast, I was also beginning to learn how isolated so many farmers feel and the many pressures they're under due to political policies and the forces of global agribusiness. They need our support, not vilification. The passion and innovation I encountered at Groundswell from both young and old was truly inspiring. I couldn't help marvel at how philosophical and poetic these farmers could be when talking about the land, the seasons and their work. Many of us connect with nature through, say, a good ramble, bird watching, or vicariously through the writings of the likes of Helen MacDonald or Bobby McFarlane. But spending time with these farmers reminds me of a quote from the artist Andy Goldsworthy. I only really feel that I know a place when I've worked there. We'll finish with some words of wisdom from Abby and Daphne. Gabe Brown kind of famously says, like, getting up in the morning, he used to have to think about what am I gonna kill today? And now when he gets up in the morning, he thinks like, what am I gonna nurture today? Gabe Brown is kind of one of the more famous regenerative farmers in the United States. You know, I've heard UK farmers reflect that as well. Like their mental health has shifted completely since they started farming in this way. You know, we can't underestimate the power of that ultimately. Actually, the key to it is that the story is good. The regenerative agriculture story is really good and it really chimes in with, with the biodiversity loss you know, which is a massive issue we're facing. You know, the biodiversity levels on these farms is just unbelievably higher than on a conventional or chemical farm. I think that's something that you really notice is when you go to a regenerative farm, it feels good to be there. It feels nourishing, you feel joyful, you can hear the birds, it just feels alive. You know, no wonder people have been put off being farmers and farming for so long. Not only is it not profitable, but profitable, but it feels horrible to be there. Um, and so really shifting into this place of life and, and, and that um, the symbiosis and the, the kind of everything working together, I think that's a really exciting shift. It's funny being in your 70s. And it's really, really interesting. And I also have to say that turning 70, I feel as wild as a snake. I felt really wild <laughs> in my 20s. And it's the only decade that feels like this. And I actually feel we're at a very, very positive time. I think it's a time of opportunity. It reminds me of the 60s, the late 60s, when there was a great outpouring of unity and gatherings and optimism. And this is the first time, I suppose, in this late part of my adult life, that I feel I'm touching that again. I've really begun to understand that actually even using the word nature, I, I, won't, I don't, generally don't use that word if I can. Um, I'll use talk about living systems or the living world, but I won't use nature because that is inherently saying that it's something other than what I am. Um, and that actually I am part of the living system and the living world. And I had an, ins I was just like sitting there one day and I realized that you know, I'd always seen the water cycle as outside of me. I'd seen it in many textbooks. And suddenly I realized that water went through me and I'm part of the water system. Like 
why don't they ever put a human in the diagram which shows then the water goes through the mouth then down into the blood you know from 70 percent water why have i never recognized that i am part of the water system um or the water cycle sorry um and so more and more i am realizing um that it is all connected and and that we really need or the more we can frame ourselves in with the systems and cycles around us and recognize we're just we're you know we're part of it like everything else it's actually a, yeah, a guy called Farmer Rishi, really. He was one of the first people who also helped me really understand this. When he talked about like the language of regeneration versus the language of degeneration, and that you can't really have regenerative agriculture if you still use the language of degeneration. And he would say the word uh, environment is a degenerative word. Um, and instead he suggests that we talk about the body and that everything around us is part of the body. Um, our body and and you know like why does it hurt in my stomach when I see fires in the Amazon? Well, that's because it's part of my body That's where you start to look to other cultures and you know other languages and you start to realize like Well, that's just how the English language frames it But actually there's many other cultures that don't even have a word for nature the theory of evolution is not to do with survival of the fittest that is one small way of understanding what goes on is very much about collaboration, it's about diversity, it's about the resilience of diversity um, and you know there there is an aspect of competition in there as well. Yeah I don't know maybe it's, it's just like we've had a bit of a monocultural view on different uh, insights, narratives that have come through time and they're ones that serve people in power is what I would assume. Be, you know I studied physics, I did a master's of physics and I very much felt like the way that science was understood and taught was a very masculine way of doing things and that my feminine way of understanding certain things was not was not welcome but that wasn't the received wisdom about how to go about things um, and I think you see that playing out a little bit now like you know the indigenous knowledge that for so long was considered to be uh, ridiculous I would say like and now suddenly they're like oh actually there's a lot of value in this and oh yeah these people are really innovative in their way you know they they know a lot and now knowledge exploration and sharing is much more network based um, and it's much more distributed. I mean, there's still powerful people, don't get me wrong, but there's space for the distribution. Um, and I think that's why you're starting to see different narratives come through. Adventures in Utopia was produced and presented by me, David Bramwell, with music from Oddfellows Casino. For more info, go to drbramwell.com or contact me on Twitter at Dr. Bramwell. Huge thanks to all of my guests in this episode and for the support of Hawkwood College. The idea of Newtopia was established by John and Yoko in 1973 as a place with no boundaries and whose international anthem is silence. Gratitude and support to our friends at Journey to Newtopia for their role in our provenance. This podcast was made possible by the generous sponsorship of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. You can tell a lot about a podcast from the folk who choose to sponsor it. Our rival podcast, The Nemesis, Escapades in Futuropia, stupid name, may have bigger budgets and more competent presenters and better guests, but let's not forget that they're sponsored by oil magnates, dictators, tyrants and companies who make penny whistles for small children. This podcast series is sponsored by an ecological and spiritual organization dedicated to teaching students about the Eightfold Wheel of the Year, rituals, self-development, and the magical properties of trees, plants, animals, and the earth. Home learning courses in six different languages present Druidry in an accessible, direct way with online and postal learning and a team of over 50 mentors and 200 groups around the world. So you really don't need to live near Stonehenge to participate. Find out more at druidry.org. If you've enjoyed Adventures in Utopia, please leave a review for us, tell your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to find out about future episodes.